We're used to seeing Pastor Tim uh, come up. He is currently on a men's retreat motorcycle trip uh, in Kentucky. So um, that's where he is this uh, this uh, Sunday morning. And uh, so please be in prayer for him. But we are super excited to have um, Noah Lewis here with us. This is uh, um, Noah. He is he is currently. He's currently serving in Life Resurrection, is that right? Life Res- Resurrection Church. The Resurrection Church, and uh, uh, maybe he'll tell you a little bit about himself, but we are welcome. want to welcome him and his wife here today. Thank you. Well, good morning. It is great. It is my great joy to worship and... Uh, just gather together with you all around God's Word. I am joined this morning by my beautiful wife. I uh, just turned 25 this past week. Um, We've got our first baby on the way. So I've I've got zero parenting experience. I've been in ministry for a couple years now. Um, And none of you guys really know me. And so Maybe you're asking the question, what authority, like, why are you able to, to stand up here today? And I, I would say that that's a great question. But Pastor Tim told me that, that we, all of you guys believe in, in the authority of Scripture. So I'm just going to hide behind the Word of God, and, and we're going to let the Word do the talking this morning. Sound good? Yeah. So four weeks ago, we celebrated the greatest event in all of history. Jesus Christ's resurrection. We celebrated the the event that, that makes all of this gathering, all of this preaching, all of this singing worth it. It's the event that the Apostle Paul says that if it did not happen, we Christians are the most pitiful folks around. The big question today, 2,000 years years later, is what now? Yes, we we know Jesus got up from the grave and and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, but, but what now? In 2023, what now? Well, people need to know. Folks everywhere need to know that our king is alive. Like, like they need to know it. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 28. We're going to start in verse 16, and then we're going to read all the way down to verse 20. While you're turning there, I want to paint a picture for you of what I am afraid of this morning. Here's a picture. You just had a week, like a long week. You worked, maybe you, you had some chores to do at the house, uh, maybe you had some errands to run. But now it's Sunday. And hey, like all of that stuff that you did throughout the week, like that's no small feat, like that's amazing. But, but it's Sunday now. Right? And so, so we gather our stuff up and, and we get into the car and we, we head to church and, and finally we arrive at church. Right? So we come through the doors and, and we see a, a bunch of people and, and it's easy to categorize people and, and see, okay, we've got folks with a gift of encouragement maybe uh, greeting us as we walk in. Uh, maybe some folks with a gift of hospitality are over by the coffee station. We've got folks with the gift of leadership, maybe up front, pushing the vision forward. Then we've got another group of folks that maybe they're like, they're the, they're the prayer folks. Like they're just zealous about prayer. Like that's their thing. Then we've got folks with an organization or administrative gift and, and they're, they're kind of doing their thing. We've got folks up, in, up here uh, in the balcony doing the tech stuff and, and, and we've just got all of our little silos of, in corners of the church 
And what I'm afraid might happen if we're not careful is we can forget that, like, we're all in, on the same team. Like, we've all got the same exact mission. Like, we, no matter what your gifting is, we've all got the same mission. And so then what happens if we're not careful is we create sort of another corner of the church. And this, this, this corner is the one where the folks that have the, the evangelism gift and the outreach and the mission gift, and they're like passionate about, about pushing this, this name of Jesus forward. Like that's their thing. And, and, and we put them in their own corner. This is the, these are the folks that, that are extroverted and gifted in communication and persuasive and they can just answer all of the toughest questions with ease. And so we, we say, this is for you. Like the, this outreach, this, this mission stuff, like this is for you. And so we reserve the spread of the gospel to a select few individuals. And then occasionally throughout the years, we have a sermon preached on mission. And it's kind of just like its own little standalone sermon. And then like we've got 51 other sermons throughout the year on all types of other things throughout the word of God. But, but mission is just its own little thing. And we reserve it to the folks that have the gift. This is how Rich Richardson says it. He says, this paradigm, the, the salesman model of evangelism, is a barrier to Christians, for it leaves them feeling like they don't really have a part to play in it. If they aren't extroverted, persuasive, an expert on their product, skilled at responding to the questions that will come up, and able to be pushy and assertive when it comes to making the clothes, then they don't identify with evangelism as part of their life and gifts. My goal today is to dismantle this picture and to show that no matter what your gifting is, that the spread of the gospel is for you. Like no matter, no matter what you're coming in here with, like this is for you. That if you are in Christ, if you're a Christian, then the spread of of the gospel is for you. You belong not on the bench, but you belong on the field. So why don't we read the great words in Matthew 28. We'll plead with God for help, and then we will dive in. Matthew 28, starting in verse 16, this is how the Bible reads. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Pause. So I've been to a few funerals throughout my life. None of them got up. Like, none of them rose from the dead. Like, this Jesus got up. And so if he says all authority has been given to me, I'm all in. Because he got up from the grave. And this is what... He says, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Father, encourage our hearts this morning through your word. Set our hearts on fire for the spread of your name in all of the earth. It's for your beautiful name, I pray. Amen. If you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, then the spread of the gospel is for you. The big question, though, is is why? Like, why can we not just leave the spread of the gospel to its own select corner of the church and, and to the folks that have the gift and, and preach about it one Sunday out of the year and just kind of leave it 
in its own little category. Why can't we do that? Well, because the spread of the gospel, the spread of God's glory, it's not just the corner of the Bible. It quite literally is the whole entire story of the book. Like, this is God's ultimate end. Like, this is God's goal. The spread of his name uh, amongst all peoples. This is, this is the plan. This is not just something that we see in the Great Commission. This is not just something we see in Matthew 28. No, like, again, this is the story of the entire Bible. It's God's ultimate end, so it must be our ultimate end, regardless of our gifting. God's passion for his glory being made known all over the earth is the story of the Bible. Let's just do a quick overview of the Bible. So, Genesis. What's the big thing that happens in Genesis? It starts with a C. Creation. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. Like, before anything ever was, God was. Before was, was, God was. That'll mess with you if you think about it. There's a being who calls himself Yahweh. And it means I am. Like, he just is. Wholly independent of anything else in all of existence, he's God. And like, we've got to deal with that. And through his powerful word, let the cosmos were formed. And everything that was not started becoming. In the beginning, God. And everything he created, he says it was good. Then he created mankind in his own image. And he breathed into mankind the breath of life, and man became a living being. He says this was very good. But, but what's the purpose of mankind? Like, why does mankind exist. Well, the Bible tells us that mankind exists to glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10 31 says, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Like, this is why we do what we do. It's for God's glory. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. This is not something that we just see in the New Testament. This is, this is the story of of the universe. God's intention has always been that a people made in his image would image him rightly and fill the earth with his image. Genesis 1.28 says this, and God blessed them. And I wonder, like, what's the purpose of the blessing? As God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and of the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is the first commissioning. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Fill it with what? A, a peoples that image God rightly. And we know it did not take too long for the woman to, the, Adam and Eve, to screw stuff up. Like, it, it did not take too long. Adam and Eve fell short of the glory of God. And sin, like a wildfire, spread throughout the world. But again, God's goal is that the world would be filled with his glory. And so do we think that this just like completely thwarted God's goal? No, no. We see actually in Genesis 3.15 
our very first gospel sighting, our very first good news. That's what the Bible says. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Then we have Abraham, the one who's through whose line that all of this would be accomplished. Father Abraham, the one who had many sons, many sons had father, Father Abraham, the moon worshiper himself. And why? Why this pagan idolater? Like, why would God promise a blessing to a man like this? Like, is he just blessing him just... Just to bless him, or, or is, there, is there purpose in the blessing? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. Why? 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 So that you will be a blessing. He says, I will bless you. But there's purpose in it. Like God, God doesn't just do things haphazardly. God's got purpose. That's good news. He says, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God has this huge goal within him that all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth will come to the knowledge of him. And then God promises this same exact promise to Isaac and to Jacob, to, to Israel. Genesis 26, 4. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, and I will give to your offspring all these land. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. There's purpose here. Genesis 28, 14. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. There's a lot of dust on the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God desires that the world would be filled up with the knowledge of his glory. This is the big story of the Bible. Habakkuk 2.14 tells us this too. It says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God is zealous about the spread of his glory. God's passionate about this. Then when the Israelites found themselves enslaved by the Egyptian, and the Lord sent Moses to free the people and harden Pharaoh's heart, like, what's the reason for it all? Right, like, I don't just want to read these Bible stories and, and just learn a bunch of facts. Like, facts mean absolutely nothing if I don't get to know God through the facts. Like, we're not just learning facts for facts' sake. We want to know God. I want to know God. What is he like? God, what are you up to in the world? Help me understand your purposes, God. Why, why let your people who, who you promised to bless be enslaved? What's the reason for it all, Lord? Well, Exodus 9, 16. It says, but for this purpose, like, this is the reason why, but for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So that, it's a purpose clause. God wants his name proclaimed in all the earth and that's why he does what he does. Let's keep going. So he sends the plagues, 
hardens Pharaoh's heart. Israelites are freed. And to where? Like, to, to where? To the promised land? Well, not yet. Like, that's coming. But, but, but where to immediately? Well, to, to the ocean. To the Red Sea. Really, Lord? The ocean? The Red Sea? Like, you done did all that to get us out of slavery and now to the ocean? And, and Pharaoh had, had a little bit of a second thought and, and said, no, we've got to go get them. I know we let the Israelites go, but now we're going to go get them. Let's go, him and all of his army, after the Israelites, Israelites stuck at the sea and and. Egyptian army pressing in and see. And, and what now? God, what are you doing? Well, this is what God's doing. Exodus 14, 4. It says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And as Israel grows and kings are established, the knowledge of God fills the earth. It begins to spread. 1 Kings 4.34 says this, And people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. And when Solomon builds the temple, what's the, what's the purpose in it all? Like, why did he build the, the, the temple in Jerusalem? Like, was he just building the temple so, so him and the homeboys had like a place to chill? No, 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 no. There was purpose in the temple. 1 Kings 8.43, it says, Hear in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. And 1 Kings 8.60, we, we keep going. It says, and that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. Like, this is the great story of all of the Old Testament. God being zealous about the spread of his glory, not just in Israel, but amongst all the people. He blessed Israel so that they might be a blessing. There's purpose here. And as we read through uh, Joshua and Judges, as we, see, as we see finally the land, the promised land. But we also see in Joshua and Judges some of the most gruesome books. We see God's wrath kindled. These books are really difficult to read sometimes. Like, God, what are you doing? And and surely, I I hope that we can't just read books of the Bible that are filled with God's wrath and not be moved in such a way to to tell people that, that they need to know who he is. Like, our God is a, is a gracious God, it's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. But our God is also a consuming fire. And, and we've got friends. And we, we know people. We've got family. We've got coworkers. We've got neighbors. And there are nations and there are people all over the world that do not image God rightly. They don't say in their heart, Jesus is Lord. They don't worship him. And if, if we can just 
read these books and not be moved. Like, save yourselves. Don't harden your hearts. Save yourselves. It is right now. It is here. This is for all of us. The world needs to know that Jesus is Lord. This is the great goal of God. I'm not done. We've got a whole hymnal in the middle of our Bibles called Psalms. And it cues us in to the heart and the desires of our great God. It's amazing. Psalm 67 one through four, many of you guys know this one by heart. It says this, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. Pretty awesome, right? But, but, but what's the point of the grace? What's the point of the blessing? What's the point of his face shining upon us? Like, w- w- for what purpose? That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all the nations. Let the people praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the people with equity. And you guide the nations upon the earth. Let the people praise you, O oh God. Let all the people praise you. Psalm 66, 1 through 5. Shout to you. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings the praises to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome. In his deeds towards the children of man. And when Israel falls from grace and, and starts worshiping the gods of the nations, little g, gods of the nations, the Lord sends prophets with a twofold message. On the one hand, the message of the prophets was uh, repent. Turn from your wicked ways, change your mind, and turn to God again because God's wrath is an all-consuming fire and he will not be mocked. Repent. This is the message that we see throughout the prophets. But we also see a message of hope. That the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be fulfilled. A message of hope. That the promise made to David will be fulfilled. There would be a perfect king that would image God rightly and would reign forever and his blood would purchase peoples from all over the globe. And God's glory would permeate the earth. God is zealous about his name being proclaimed in all of the earth. This is the great goal of God. Isaiah 19, 23 says, In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And Assyria will come into Egypt and Egypt into Assyria. And the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. This is crazy. I wish we had more time to unpack the context of this, but this is, trust me, this is wild. Isaiah 42, 4, when prophesying about the suffering servant, this is what Isaiah says. He says, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. And like, this, is, this is the heartbeat in, in Isaiah. Isaiah 26, 8. Like, this is, this is what it's all about. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. For your, for your name and your renown are the desires of our hearts. Your name and your renown. Other translations say your remembrance 
or your fame. Like, there's a desire in our hearts that we would get. So, so names in the Bible carried much more weight than they carry now. Like names are like your person. Like that's who you are. And so, so the prophet's saying, your name, who you are, God, we want you and we want your renown too. We want your remembrance. We want your name to spread. Your name and your renown are the desires of your, our hearts. In Ezekiel 36, we, we see maybe, maybe the most vivid picture of God's desire for his glory. This is what it says in, Isaiah, in Ezekiel 36. It says, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. And which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. God is zealous about his name being known and adored in all of the universe. This is what God's about. And I wish we could just keep on going throughout the Old Testament. But I know you guys don't want to hear me talk all day long. So, so let's, let's just let's jump into the New Testament. But I, I just want you to get this picture that, that this is so much bigger than just a little tiny blurb of the New Testament when, when Jesus says, go into all of the earth and make disciples. Like, like, this is the story. Like, this is what God is about. And then enters Jesus. The true and better Adam. The one in the fire. The one who, who, who was foretold when, when Abraham said, there will be a sacrifice provided. Isaac said, what do you mean, dad? A lamb will be provided. Well, because on that mountain that day, it was a ram that was provided. So who's the lamb? Jesus. Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Because there's no amount of blood in all of the bulls and goats in all of the universe that can actually make atonement for sin. There is no judge, there's no deliverer that can actually free people like Jesus. And so Jesus shows up to fulfill all of the law and all of the prophets. He is the culmination of it all. Jesus. So when Jesus shows up after 400 years of silence, what was he about? Like, what did Jesus care about? What was Jesus zealous about while he was on the earth? Let's just look at a couple examples. Well, think about the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. If, if, if we could get our minds wrapped around the historical context of, of Jesus, a Jew, with a Samaritan woman during the day, absolutely wild. Because although Jesus came to his own and he, he adored his own people, Jesus was not just about his own. Jesus was about all people's knowing who his father was. We see Jesus feeding 5,000 of his own people. But, but if that wasn't enough, we also see him feeding uh, 4,000 Gentiles as well. Because 
Jesus was zealous about God's glory in all people. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us what the purpose of good works are. He says that they would see your good works and that they would give glory to God. Like, we ain't just out here doing good works for good works' sake. We do good works so that people would see them and say, I want some of that. How how do I get some of that? Let me tell you about my Jesus. There's purpose in good works. When Jesus teaches on prayer, he says, he says, hey, hey, don't pray like this. But, but here's how you ought to pray. He says, pray like this. And the crux of Jesus' prayer, the Our Father prayer is, hallowed be thy name. And what does that mean? What, what, what does that mean, that his name would be hallowed? Well, well, it's a petition that the name would be set apart, that his name would be holy, that his name would be sanctified. Like, God, do this to me. Hallow your name in my heart. I want your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. But, but his kingdom can't come on earth as it is in heaven unless his name is hallowed in our hearts. And so the crux of Jesus' prayer was, hallowed be thy name. And that's my prayer as I'm, as I'm driving here this morning is, like, Lord, hallow your name And the people here at Grace, do it, God. So that your name would be hallowed outside of Grace. Because if your name just gets hallowed here, but it doesn't get hallowed out there, what are we doing? Hallowed be thy name. And we see Jesus praying for unity. And he says, what's what's the goal? Jesus says, when we are united, and and he's praying to God, like this is, this is crazy. Like we are seeing a trinity, a trinitarian prayer. We're seeing God the Father and God the Son having a conversation. And it's cueing us into what God wants. Jesus is praying. He's he's praying that they, meaning Christians that would come after his death, burial, and resurrection, he says that they would be perfectly one. And he says once that happens, like once the church, once Christians are unified together, then they will know. Then they will know. Then the world will know that you are God. So the goal of unity is that a dying world would would look into this church and say, oh my gosh, what are you doing up in this little building unified on a Sunday when you could be sleeping? Like, and why are you standing up together and and singing praises to to this God that you believe in? And and what is the purpose of it? And, and, because typically, folks that look like me don't typically hang out with folks that look like a lot of y'all. I'm going to just keep it real. Like it, that doesn't typically happen in most settings of the world. And so like, I just, I wonder, like I wonder what a lost and dying world thinks when we are unified together. Like I wonder. Perhaps, maybe, there's a God that crosses all racial and age and socioeconomic bounds. Like, maybe. And and maybe they would see it, and maybe they'd give glory to God because of it. There's purpose in our unity. And as Jesus is dying on the cross, what does he cry? He says, Father, forgive them. 
Lord, does, he does not want anybody to perish. He wants all people to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord. This is what our king is about. And then, then, after, after all of this, he dies and he gets up, shows himself to a boatload of people proving he is God. I am who I said I am. Then he gives the great commission that we read in Matthew 28. Then we see the, the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. Jesus sends his Holy Spirit, and he says it's actually going to be better for us. And what was the purpose of Jesus sending the Holy Spirit? Well, it's that we would be his witness, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is like right here, and in Samaria, and in all of the earth, to the ends of the earth. Like, like that's the point of the Holy Spirit, that we would be uh, sealed with the promise of God himself, and that we would be filled up with him in such a way that we would fill the earth with the knowledge of Jesus as Lord and Savior and King and Father and all in all. We see Peter's first sermon at Pentecost in Acts 2, where folks were so cut to the heart after his sermon. They say, what do I do in response to this? And he says, repent and believe. They just all gave their life to the Lord. Like, I, I want to preach like that. The power of the Holy Spirit causes the name of God to spread. Because God does not just bless so that we might hoard his blessing. No, no, God blesses so that it might be a conduit for all of the earth to also share in that blessing because God is zealous. He's passionate. He really, really cares about his name and about his renown and about his remembrance and about people everywhere worshiping him and imaging him rightly. This is what the Lord cares about. See, the first martyr in church history, Stephen. And this, this leads to the disbursement of the church and more people coming to know Jesus. It's crazy. So like suffering, like intense persecution and suffering unto the point of death. And what's the purpose of it all? Well, that God would get glorified and that his name would get dispersed, and that people would continue to come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about. This is God's great goal. And then Paul, Paul, persecutor of the church, Paul. Why save this guy? Why would you do that, God? Well, Galatians 1, 15 and 16 tells us the purpose that God had for stepping in on Paul's life and saving him. This is, this is it. Galatians 1, 15 through 16 says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased. God, you were pleased? Yes, the text said he was pleased to reveal his son, Jesus, to Paul of all people. Paul, God, pleased, excited to reveal Jesus to Paul. And then we see the purpose clause. In order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. So God, stepping into a broken life, 
and freeing him from the bondage of sin. A man completely undeserved, unmerited, unearned. It's called grace. He stepped in and he rescued him from the blindness that he was under. And there was purpose in all of that, that he might proclaim Jesus among the Gentiles. When Paul tells Timothy to pray for kings and rulers, he cues us into God's heart behind it all. He says, God, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants every single one of us to know him as Savior, but not just keep it to ourselves. He wants that to flow through us and that all peoples would know that Jesus is Lord. God is zealous about the spread of his glory amongst all peoples. And what about, what about the, the Mount Everest book of Romans? What about that? What was the purpose of writing that letter, Paul? Like, why? Romans, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But like, that's just the bad news. It says, and are justified freely by his blood. Because God presented him, meaning Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement. He did this to demonstrate his forbearance. Because in his justice, he let the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So as to be just and the one that justifies those who have faith in him. Like, where's boasting then? Well, it's excluded. Men and women all over the world justified by faith in Jesus Christ. There's no difference. Jew, Gentile, he wants them all. And the purpose of the letter, surely it was encouragement. Surely the gospel was proclaimed. But ultimately, like the book of Romans was a missionary support letter. Paul's trying to raise money to go tell more people about Jesus. Because God is zealous about the spread of his glory. And how does the Bible end? Revelation 7, 9 through 10, it says this. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and all of the peoples and all of the languages standing before the throne, the throne of grace, and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Like, this is where history is going. Like, we got the book. Like, we know how the story ends. Like, we got the book, y'all. Like, this is how it ends. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All peoples crying out together. What a glorious day this will be. I can't wait. I'm fired up for that day. I am fired up for that day. And if, if this is where the train of history is going, God's name being seen and enjoyed and loved and adored in all of the earth, if, if that's where history is going and if that's God's ultimate goal, and it won't be thwarted, then I want to be on that train. If, if this is God's goal, that his name would be known in all of the earth, and it's not your goal or my goal, but whose goal do you think needs to change? Because This is what God is about. He wants all people to know his name. So, wife's right here. I hear her right now in my ear. Noah, you're living up in the clouds. I need some application. 
Like, give me something to take home. Like, give me something to do. Okay. Fine. 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 Every single one of us does not have the gift of evangelism. We don't. We don't. And yet, we are all still called to live on mission. We are all still called to to open up our hands and say, God, whatever you've placed in them, my time, all of the time that you've given to me, all of the talents that you've given to me, all of the resources that you've given to me, all of the money, all of the treasures that you've, everything, Lord, everything that you've put in my hands, Lord, for the spread of the gospel. This is why God puts things in your hands. This is what Bruce Barton says. He says, we are not all evangelists in the formal sense, but we have all received gifts that we can use to help fulfill the Great Commission. Rich Richardson says, your most important contribution to witness, in fact, lies in the area of your gifting. I think we need to zoom out and have a bigger perspective on this great commission, on on our mission as a church. Like the fact that we are sitting here in Elgin, Illinois, in 2023, when this happened some 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world, and, and if we just think, like, how did it get here? This is crazy. Well, for one, he actually, like, got up. Like, this, this actually happened. But how did, the, how did the news about his resurrection get here 2,000 years later across the globe? And why are we gathered here singing about it? Well, because a band of misfits called the Disciples saw something and were filled with someone. And with all of their flaws, started preaching it. And then people started receiving it. Broken people living in broken homes with limited resources and limited time started talking about it. And it started spreading and people started suffering, and they refused to bow the knee, and they kept talking about what they saw and what they heard and who's now filling them, and it just kept going forward. And I'm telling you, that's how it's still happening today, and that's how it's always going to happen. Seed is going to get planted. The Holy Spirit's going to cause growth. It's going to till up soil. People are going to call out. By faith, and it's going to keep on going. And I know it's going to keep on going because I know how the end of the story is. God is zealous about the spread of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I planted Apollos water, but it was God that gave the growth. None of us need to feel any type of fear that maybe we don't have all of the answers. Maybe I, I can't respond to everything with ease. Maybe I've only been in this for a couple months. Maybe I've only been in this for a couple years. Maybe you're, you feel like you should know more than you do. Maybe you feel like you're on your last leg. Maybe you've, maybe you've been suffering. Maybe you feel like you don't have that many years left to live. Maybe you're just busy. And like to add this on to your life, it just seems like 
Like, this would just be too much. Friends, I hope this, like, liberates us today to know it, it's not up to you. It's not up to me. We're going to plant seeds. We're going to water seeds. God's going to just cause growth. This is what he does. This is what he's been doing for thousands of years, and he's going to keep on doing it. Like, this is what he does. And for those of us that think we've only got a couple years left to live, I'm telling you, y'all have wisdom and experience that young folks like me need. Like the spread of the gospel is here. Like it's right now. People need to know that there is a God who loves them. And I don't, I, again, I, I don't care if you don't know all of the answers. It's okay. Tell them what Jesus did for you. Tell them that you were blind and now you see. Tell them that you didn't have purpose and now you do. Tell them that you were, you've got this crazy testimony. You were one way and now you're another way. Tell them, tell them that. You don't have a crazy testimony. But somehow, by the grace of God, you just couldn't leave. Like he's just kept you your whole entire life. You don't have a crazy story, but somehow you, his grace is just so real that it's held you your whole entire life. Let him know he is alive. So here's, here's how I want to I wanna finish. Let's open up our hands. Let's just think. What is what has God placed in our hands? What intellect has God given us? What money has God given us? What time has God given us? What talents has God given us? What connections? has God given us? When I started, I, I shared a picture of what I am afraid of, that we would all be in our different silos of the church and, and kind of just keep this mission and evangelism and God's name spreading stuff kind of separate to somebody else. That, that, that picture I'm afraid of, but, but let me paint another picture. A picture of, where those of us who are zealous about prayer get down on our knees and pray that this will happen, that his name would go forth, that our neighbors and our coworkers and our wayward kids and our parents and our communities and uh, all of the earth would know him. Let's get on our knees and pray like that. Where those of us who have an administrative gift and an organization gift would plan and organize and administrate all types of events with what purpose? That people would know him. That those of us with, with a gift of leadership would, would lead in such a way to galvanize a group of people to know him. A picture where, where our money is spent so that people might know him. Where our marriages, like, like people would look at our marriages and say, how do you love like that? And they would see it and that they would know him. And in our retirement, we don't, we don't think that, that, that it's just a relax into uh, the end of our time. No, 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 there's work to be done. We spend our retirements for the spread of God's glory. I'm not working 40 hours a week anymore. I've got 40 more hours a week that I'm going to figure out the gospel needs to get proclaimed. Friends, what has God put in your hands? Whether much or whether it's little, might he use it for the spread of 
of his glory among all the peoples. Let's pray. Father, would you do it? Would you do it, God? The accomplishment of the Great Commission. That individuals would go into their communities, into their uh, workplaces, into their families' homes, and they would sow seeds, and they'd water seeds. God, I pray that you would show up and cause growth. Because our charisma, our knowing all of the answers, our having a rebuttal to every question is not going to do nothing if the Holy Spirit does not show up and cause growth. So God, would you embolden us, Lord, for the spread of the gospel amongst all peoples. Do it, Lord. You've been doing it for thousands of years, and we trust that you're going to continue to do it, Lord. Your name and your fame is the desires of our hearts. Help us, Lord. Help our wayward children. Maybe they were walking with you at one point. They're no longer walking with you, God. God, grab a hold of their heart, Lord. Break them in their sin, Lord. Call them back home. Lord, for, for our friends that, that do not image you rightly, Lord, cause them to see the way that we live and say there's something to it and call them home, Lord. Help, Jesus. It's for your beautiful name, I pray. Amen.